I'm sorry you have to live with the fear of thinking you might not make your homework and be when you leave the house when you go to class. So they just want you to make it back home safe. So just be careful out there. The streets are dangerous. It's not it's not built for you. So one thing I would like to tell people is that you have to be very cautious of your tone of your voice or you may be a animalistic beast. You have to be very cautious when you walk, you know, don't make any threatening gestures. So, you know, I just want to tell everybody that, you know, it's tough being a black man in America. What's up? Welcome back to my channel. It's your girl Whitney and I'm back with another episode with some very special guest. Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Francis. Uh, nice to meet all y'all. Yo, what's up, everybody? My name is Ben Foule. You know, <laughs> not Foule. Yeah, you already know how I go. You might have seen me on Instagram, Snapchat. You might have seen Ooh. me doing something foolish, but I'm out here. <laughs> <laughs> Son, he gotta go. This is why they can't take black people seriously. Why? I'm giving you. You told me to get an entrance. I'm giving an entrance. I ain't do no WWE entrance. Man, I ain't have no pyro. Someone throw me a bucket hat, rolling up a cup of honey and nah. But let's begin. Let's begin. You know? All right. So, all right, guys. So we have a kind of serious topic to discuss today. We're going to be discussing the realities of being an African American male in the United States. <sighs> so, y'all, how's it like being a nigger in America? You had the ER, wow. The ER, so you know it's real because, I mean, at this point, our, that's what our president is calling us. Well, not my president. Y'all president. Oh, my president's still black. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still rocking with Obama, but to be honest with you, it's just one of those things. The more you the more you think about it, the more mad you get, you know, seeing civil rights documentaries, seeing the stuff that they used to do. You know, it's, it's 2018, and we're still having accomplishments that black people are doing. Like, wow, you know, so it's definitely... It's definitely a surreal feeling, though. Yeah, most definitely. Um, speaking from the point of being in corporate America, where um, you can't really be yourself in the in the office because it's more of a white man's world up in there. So you have to kind of like white yourself out just to kind of fit in. So that's uh, one of the struggles I can uh, point out is being being black in corporate America. So do you guys feel like on a daily basis you guys are racially profiled? Oh yeah, of course. You know, I notice like the tone of your voice when you like when talking on the phone, when I do help desk, it's always quick to say, let me speak to a supervisor. Like he doesn't know what he's talking about instantly just by the tone of my voice. You know, definitely when you walk by, you always have to like introduce yourself or someone's going to get a negative connotation of what type of person you are. So it's like, oh, yeah, how you doing today? Oh, I thought he was mean, you know. Oh, I thought he was going to last six weeks on the job. Like when pe you have to people have to get to know you first. And I feel like that's unfair. When you automatically see someone white, you're like, all right, he's going to be a good worker. But black, you have to introduce yourself. So it's definitely a hassle. I definitely feel like you have to work two times harder being colored in America. It's like you're put in a system that's already setting you up for failure. And so every day you're working hard just not to fail. It's not like when you're, let's say, Caucasian, for instance, you're already at put on a standard that, hey, this person is going to win. They need to succeed. They have white privilege, so why can't they succeed? But for us, it's like, no, you need to pick up your slack. You need to do better. So you're not falling behind or you're not falling, fitting into the stereotype of being a black lazy nigga <laughs> um, all right so here's a scenario where um i was coming back from new york so i was driving got pulled over in baltimore uh it was a cop it was a black cop who pulled me over um took my license registration ran it saw that my record was clean he told me to get out the car looked me in my eyes told me he was like yo how many times have you gotten arrested and put in jail and i was like wait what you mean like locked up and he was like yeah and i said zero and he was like, are you sure? Is this your right address and whatnot? And I was like, yeah, this is my right address. He was like, are you positive you haven't gotten arrested before? I said, sir, are you seeing something in the system? And he was like, no. He was like, this is just rare. Somebody like you, I'm like, what do you mean like me? And he goes like, you're a big black dude. Like, like wh what are you talking about? At that point, I wasn't trying to, you know, go back and forth with him because, you know, he's a cop. I probably wasn't going to make it home if I, you know, Kind of hassle with them, but yeah, that's one of the um, scenarios that I've I faced being black in America. You said something interesting that I was afraid that I wouldn't make it back home. 
how was that fear like i know it's different okay being a woman i don't have to deal with that constant fear well i mean there's sandra bland but i feel like it's way worse for men like you really have to call somebody like yo i'm getting pulled over just to let them know like in case something happens to me y'all know what happened like how is that living with that constant fear it's not fair yeah it's, it's very strange for one thing because people look at this as oh you know he's very dangerous like look at the person who shot up the church you know, he was able to walk on his own power out of there. But someone like an African-American, oh, one person, he's dangerous. We have to shoot him. It's like, wow. You know, just the fact that we're looking as like animalistic beast, you know, being approached like that, you know, it kind of like does something to you, you know. So everything you do, you like your mom always tells you, be very respectful. You know, look him in the eye, sir, officer, sir. Yes, like sir, you just yes, have sir. to, because I feel like you, you automatically have the bullseye on your back. So you, you're held to, like you said earlier, a higher standard than everybody else when it should be the opposite because we're in a 400 year disadvantage. So it's, it's Dang, a 400 year setback. Yeah, so, Dang, that's that's the wild. so that's the craziest thing. Like how, how are we held to a bigger standard and we're the most disadvantaged people. So that's just something to think about. It's wild. Absolutely, I do agree with uh, Bemba right here because um, being black in America, you have to watch everything you do. You have to be mindful of everything you do because one wrong tone, one wrong action can just uh, set you back like from even progressing even in the workplace. So it's crazy out here. Like you really have to be mindful of every single thing you do while your white coworkers are free to just do whatever they want to do. Exactly. And I feel like it's so frustrating that we also have to walk on eggshells or that other people have to feel like they need to walk on eggshells when they're talking to us. Yeah. Oh my gosh, like I don't know how many times white people are like, oh, I love your hair, can I touch it? Or can I ask you this? Um, mm -hmm. So how do you pronounce, I don't want to offend you, but how do you pronounce this in African? Like, son, Bruh. what? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> what? Like, one, you shouldn't be asking anybody nonsense like that. Two, don't touch my hair. Like, I've paid good money for it, okay? Mm -hmm. And three, I feel like it's so frustrating that we live in a society where people feel like they either have to be completely reckless or politi politically correct all the time. But then again, can we blame them? Look at who's in office. Like, he called Africa a shithole country. Like, he calls black people pigs. And... Like, so why wouldn't people talk recklessly when they're given such an advantage and a leeway to do so? Yeah, just going a little bit into detail about that. Like, I remember I was in, um, I was in Dallas and we was doing, I was working for a company called Copart and we had like a word association game. So someone put up, um, section eight and I, I looked at it, you know, and I had to speak up about it. Cause I was like, yeah, you know, I come from a section eight apartment myself. But the thing about it is people look at you like you're a bad person because you come from like this per um, Section 8 apartment. But the thing about it is we're good people. Our parents just didn't have the money to come up on some somewhere different. So when I talked to him about it, he was like, oh, no, I was just saying this. Like you're held to like that standard is just ridiculous. And like I would always get like confronted by a coworker and be like, yo, yo, like my manager tucking your shirt. And I'm like, yo, he's not tucking in his shirt. Like. I had to make sure like every shirt was no wrinkles. It's just, it's crazy, it's crazy. So that just proves another point. So I asked them to wear dress differently, right? So let's say they both went to an interview and I look at him, look at Francis to my left and then look at Bimpa to my right. You know I get the job. He got tattoos. Oh man, hey, don't put me up. <laughs> my mom watching. Sorry, no, I'm joking. We good. <laughs> like, and so imagine if they both went to an interview, who do you think that they would choose? Or even if they just both walked into a corporate building, who do you think that they would look at more funny? Absolutely. This brings us back to the point where um, let's talk about my first week of my new job. So uh, if y'all don't know, I just finally got a job with uh, Deloitte. Hey, hey, that's lit. Hey, so, big uh, money. Orientation was two days. So first day of orientation, you know, just wanted to dress up real good. Uh, they were like uh, dress business casual, and um, in my mind, business casual is um, dressed up suit and tie. You know, it's your first day. You want to make a good first impression at a top four company. Yeah, hey, <laughs> yeah, me. So much more it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I went in uh, all suited up, and uh, I saw the way my other uh, coworkers were, you know, dressed up. Uh, they were like. You know, real laid back. Like, if it were in a suit, you know, no tie, whatnot. So, all right, cool. The next day, orientation. I go, still wearing the same uh, suit. 
this time with no tie. Then I see uh, one other person in orientation. He's dressed like really laid back. Like he just rolled right out of bed, you know, a flannel with some burnt khakis uh, and some dirty ass sneakers. <laughs> so at, in orientation, uh, orientation leader was black. I asked her, I was like, hey, what's the uh, definition of business casual here at Deloitte? She was like, yeah, it's kind of how you're dressed, you know. Um, just just look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, can can I wear this? You know, will people judge me for wearing this? And I'm over here looking, I was like, all right, so what about that one dude, the white dude who uh, looked like he just uh, rolled right out of bed? And she was like, well, if, to give you the completely honest answer, they can wear that, but we can't. Mm. And that's crazy right. to me. It's disgusting. Yeah. But you know what's w really wild though? At the end of the day, you could be dressed like this, or you could be dressed like this. All they're gonna see is this. Mm. All they're gonna see is your skin. And like you said, we have to work twice as hard. We're 400 years set back. Like we have to work so much harder just to prove what? Just to prove what, you know? And it's really saddening actually, because you have people who have been put in situations where they're wrongfully convicted. They're in jail half their lifetime just to find out that, oh, this person didn't do it. For example, Khalif Browder. Look at everything that goes on on a daily basis. Trayvon Martin, the young man who was just shot by his neighbor in his apartment. Yeah. yeah. Like, let that sink in. That's crazy. I get pulled over and I have the fear like I'm gonna get shot today if I say the wrong thing, if I reach over for the wrong thing. Like, and it's so saddening, it really is. And so I'm really grateful that there's so, so many strides being taken to you know, improve our justice reform, but sometimes it really doesn't seem like there's any hope. Do you feel like we, we this country can change? Honestly, it's just one of those things that you, as a, um, a parent, if you have some kids, you just have to talk to your kids about the um, circumstances that we face because it doesn't look like it's going to change. We, we're still dealing with the same thing. You look at old Malcolm X speeches, old Martin Luther King speeches, we're still talking about the same thing. We've been talking about police brutality for, for years, and it's the same story. The cop always gets all free. Like a situation where someone goes into the wrong apartment, how is that even believable? If it was any other race the cop was, it wouldn't be believable. That no one had has any of y'all been to the wrong apartment before. No, uh, how do you go to the wrong apartment and then on top of that shoot somebody? Like the stories get more outrageous, but the um, conviction is still no one's convicted. So it's just one of those things where I don't see anytime soon that like the conditions will change. It's just one thing that you have to educate people on how to react when they see um authority, white authority especially. Exactly. I mean, stuff like this has always been happening. It's it's always been happening, but the reason why we're getting to know about all this is because now it's being recorded. Social media, yeah. Social media, exactly. So I feel like it, it starts from home. Racism, no kid is just born racist. You you, you were taught how to be racist. That's facts. That's and facts. I think if we're able to change that narrative, uh, we can definitely move forward together as a nation. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So do you guys feel like you're a victim to the system or you're a slave to it? Or do you feel like you've ever been put in a situation where you've had to survive? Like you've had to survive. Like let's say, for example, people that are, they've been to jail, they've been convicted, they've had felonies on their records, and it's hard for them to get a good job. So they have to work at a place that is paying the minimum wage. In Virginia, the minimum wage is seven twenty-five. dollars Do you feel like... Why would I, for me, why would I go and work a, se a job where I'm making seven twenty five an hour when I can go and sell drugs? So do you feel like you've been put in a situation where you've had to survive? Or have done, make, made some wrong choices just to survive, just to feed yourself or feed the people around you? Yes, it definitely seems like that. You, you have to, like, make choices like that because when you look at it, you go to a place like Southeast D.C., you look at how many liquor stores there are. And then you look at how many libraries there are and you say, wow, does the community really care about me? Is the community really trying to really make me do something better in my life? Like you look and see, 725, think about it. Can you even pay like an electric bill with that money? No. It's, look at the look at the cost of living that we're out here. Like, in Northern Virginia. And in DC you, you, right can't, you can't even rent a basement for, for 725. So the decisions that people make, people have to understand is it's not a decision on some, oh man, you know what I'm saying, let me just sell some pack, to, you know what I'm saying, buy some new shoes. It's a situation where we're put in a situation where interviews, it's tough as an African American to like land an interview for 
any type of job that is paying ten dollars an hour and on top of that transportation gas prices traffic all the you know so you definitely have to do what you have to do and I can't, I can't knock people for that because when you feel like you're in a situation where the community doesn't care about you you're gonna do whatever you have to do and so talk about time that you've had to do something what have you oh, had to man, do oh man <laughs> things i've had to do <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> The, the foolery, the foolery, man. I ain't going to say no incriminating details <laughs> on, on, on TV, but, you know, I definitely know some individuals who, who wish that they, they would have had to do something better. They would have had to do, like, they could have worked the 9 to 5. They wish that opportunity was for them. You know, they even did the route. They went the school route. And still, you know, they can't find a job. But we're in a situation where you, you can't go to your um, landlord and be like, oh, I can't find a job, you know, okay, I'll pay rent later. It's a situation where they don't give a damn. You better figure out how to make the money, <laughs> no matter any means possible. So, yeah. you know, I definitely understand where people are going, you know, when people sell drugs and they do fraud because you're put in a situation of hopelessness, you know, when you're, you feel like that's the only way you can survive. So it, it's tough out here. And when you feel like the, the system doesn't care about you, you know, why would you care about the system? So that's the way it goes. But then it's interesting that, okay, so I feel both ways about that situation. Like, let's say, okay, so I believe selling drugs. How? Because you're putting people, that's really detrimental to people's lives. Mm. And robbing people or credit card fraud. There's a lot of people that are doing, they cranking cards because that's easy bread. But you're stealing from someone. Mm. Like, do you really have to do all of that just to survive when you could get a job, make ends meet? If you have to get multiple jobs just to pay rent, then do so instead of, robbing somebody instead of stealing people else some uh, somebody else's hard-earned money like yeah. ideally you know that's the way you would want to go but we have to also think about it from role models like growing up you know my role model was biggie you know what i'm saying he had the, he had the european designer he was he was doing all types of wild stuff like we're not it, it's just like we're, we're put in a situation where we don't see like hey we're not surrounded by traveling like for example Parents that went to college, you know, growing up, like I had the financial aid, you know, my pops gave me his W-2 and said, figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> you know? They were like, what's FAFSA? FAFSA what's FAFSA what? like? What's it so, at? it's not a situation, like lack of knowledge is a situation where many people fail, you know? Yeah. You, you feel like there's no other way. When you feel like there's no other way, like I was going forward earlier, you, feel, you, you justify everything. You can find a reason like, oh, we're stealing money from his credit card, but... Hey, the government's stealing money from us. You know, it doesn't matter. You're not thinking logically because you don't have the positive influences around you. You know, you don't have the positive role models that you need. You know, so of course you could definitely find a couple jobs and make your money. But when you just see like, hey, you know, we can make the pack flip. You know, I give, I give you this much money. We break it down. You know more about that than how to secure an interview for a Fortune 100 company. Some people might have heard of Deloitte and been like, what's that? You know what I'm saying? I have to Google that yeah, job. Yeah, <laughs> some people wouldn't even know about that. There's so many opportunities. Some people don't even know the D.C. area is home to some of the most jobs out there. You know what I'm saying? But it's just one of those situations where I feel like just uh, being, like I said, black and American, having that 400-year um, setback and not having, like, parents that own businesses to tell us about that. You know, I know a guy who sells pack with his dad. <laughs> like, it, it sounds funny, but... We don't, have, we, don't, we don't have dads that's engineers, dads that's been in corporate America, dads that's been to school. So we just got to go with what we know, man. They driving you know, cabs. They driving cabs. So that's the saddest thing about it. But ideally, when you think about it, stealing money, selling pack, that's not the way people want to go. But it's just a sad reality that we don't, lack of positive influences that we have. You know, we, we have to choose that route. And, you know, I'm not I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying it's acceptable. But I'm also saying that we need more programs in the um, inner city and, you know, more programs for minorities. And minorities should get um, special treatment opposed to the white counterparts who have money, who've been to different experiences, who have positive role models. That's all I'm saying. Definitely a better reform system. So we're going to wrap this thing up, guys. But I wanted to ask you, so if you have a few sentences to tell Donald Trump, about being in your position, or even telling white counterparts, what would you say? I would say, uh, take the time out of your day to get to know me on a personal level, like not like on a, you know, a work level. Just, you can you can take a little bit of that and just kind of learn from it. And just don't be um, culturally ignorant, that's what I would say. 
You know, I'll keep it real brief, you know, just judge me by my character, not my skin color. That's a word. All right, guys. Thank you. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And share your thoughts. Share some experiences that you've dealt with being an African American. In the comment section below. Of course. Or, like, even white people. What are some instances that you felt like you dealt with? Have you've had negative encounters with African Americans because I know that there's some certain situations I mean people get stereotypes because it's happened before so yeah until next time guys don't, don't forget, forget to drop a like and share this video and subscribe share with your mamas share with your co-workers share with your auntie uncles all the uncles everybody everybody share with everybody all right y'all until next time until next time Wakanda for life yeah okay